Okay, thank you. All right, wonderful news, wonderful news. All right, welcome beautiful people to the San Francisco Public Library's virtual library and our first virtual book award, how fun. We wanna welcome you all to the unceded land of the Ohlone tribal people and acknowledge the many Ramutish Ohlone tribal groups as the rightful stewards in which the land on which we live and work here in our beautiful Bay Area. We also want to acknowledge the painful situation that our country seems to remain in regarding Black Lives Matter and know that the library is not a in neutral institution and we are working on our own systemic racism and ending uh, trying to figure that out and work towards equity in our country. Um, I will be, the link that I provided in the chat box there has links to all sorts of amazing information and book lists and organizations surrounding indigenous culture and Black Lives Matter. We encourage you to check that out. And we have lots of great programs um, around both of those subjects, which are now archived on YouTube. Um, there are some silver linings to pandemic um, world falling apart. So just some uh, quick announcements. We are in celebrating Viva right now, which is our Latino Heritage Month starting from now until November. And we want to encourage you all to come celebrate with us. We have many amazing authors there, as you can see, lots of art, including a partnership with the Mexican Museum and we'll have Daniel Azama coming to us from Mexico. So that's one of those silver linings. We will be celebrating Mr. Benjamin Bach Sierra, who is an amazing educator, activist, scholar. Um, he's a very, and a very cool dude, I love him. And he will be in conversation with Luis Rodriguez. He has come out with his sequel, um, Peraneta, to a book he wrote called Barrio Bushido. Both amazing books, um, loosely set in the mission, um, he's just a very great guy, and I really encourage you to check out his book. We'll also have book clubs surrounding both of his books. And I'll just breeze through some of this. If you didn't know, we have announced our One City, One Book, and so happy to say that is Chanel Miller for Know My Name. I encourage you all to get reading now. It's um, not a light read, but an important read, and you might have to set it down for a bit and come back. So get started now and encourage you to either purchase that at one of our lovely bookstores or put on hold from our library to go. And yes, super important. Please take your census. Please encourage friends to take their census. Uh, it's so important. And I have um, been working on this project since, uh, you know, way before April. And I just hope you all know how important this is. Our funding uh, is crucially tied to this. And I know people are afraid, but please encourage folks to take their census. Uh, yes, I mentioned library to go, that is happening. You may now place holds on books and pick them up when our weather is not dangerous to go out. Speaking of dangerous to go out, wear your masks, everybody. Please protect our essential workers who are serving in our, our community in the streets every day. Mask up, this beautiful art by Samuel Rodriguez. City testing is still happening. And we want to always thank our friends at the Public Library for supporting all the great authors and events that we do here. And a last um, quick notice, uh, we are encouraging folks to purchase all of the nominees books from City Lights Bookstore or Bird and Beckett, whichever one you prefer, or SFPL to go. Um, and we do have a book list prepared and all of the nominees will be in these links. And as we go along today, I'll continually send that stuff out as well as send a follow-up email to you all tomorrow. Once again, or, uh, I'm Anissa and John Smalley is the other librarian here today. We will be your tech host. And we are now turning it over to the lovely Joyce who is a Northern California book reviewer and the editor and director of Flash of Poetry Flash. Joyce, I am gonna stop sharing my screen and it is your turn to share your screen.
One moment, Joyce, you're muted. I'm unmuting you, don't push your, what did you say? So hit the green share button. I did. Okay. And do you see your window that you would like to share? I'm in Google Docs, the slides, yes. Okay. Um, so, but you need to click that, that window that you wanna share and then hit the blue share button within there. Did you hit this green share screen button? Yes. Okay, and so do you see your doc in that screen that popped up? Um. How's that? Not quite there yet, Joyce. Okay. So try hitting the green share screen button again. I did, I did. Okay, and what happens when you hit that? Now should I uh, go to uh, present? Mm, we still don't see your window. So you need to be able to see your window first. Okay, I think something's happening. <clears throat> Aha, now hit present, Joyce. Okay. Yes. We're there. Joyce, you're on. My, my apologies for all that. I've really, I've done the best I can with this. Thank you, Anissa. And welcome to the Northern California Book Awards. Coming together over books is exactly what we need right now. I'm chair of Northern California Book Reviewers a volunteer group of reviewers, librarians, book media hosts, and review editors. These awards celebrate books published in 2019 by authors based in Northern California and are presented by Poetry Flash with the San Francisco Public Library and community partners, Penn West, Mechanics Institute Library, and Women's National Book Association, San Francisco chapter. Each year, we read and discuss and passionately stew over books to tease out what we are looking for but can't yet name, to find the best from hundreds of titles by authors all over California, Northern California. This year was a challenge. It was a real challenge. We postponed these awards twice with no idea when they might happen. Longtime library collaborators were deployed to the food bank or gone. We learned to Zoom. Publishers and helpers worked remotely for the first time. Mail was suspect and sometimes quarantined. We couldn't confer with our pals at local bookshops. But we kept driving on and found in these books what we needed to steady us through our cultural, political, personal pandemics of grief and change. Today, we celebrate all of these stunning nominated books. Our decisions were keenly debated, walking a razor's edge. Oh, the drama, one of us said. This is the NCBR recommended reading list, our offering to you with deep appreciation to these gifted authors. And as Anissa, as, as Anissa showed you, books are waiting for you live and in person. See the bookshop.org, City Lights link in the chat box, and Burden Beckett Books can help you by email and phone. Our virtual program guide is linked in the chat box and posted on poetryflash.org. NCBR guidelines are there too. We begin with the Northern California Book Reviewers Recognition Award, Children's, then Translation, then Nonfiction, the Groundbreaker Award for Kim Shuck, Fiction 
poetry than Jack Hirschman. NCBR member James LeCure will present the NCBR Recognition Award for an extraordinary work beyond our categories. The award goes to The Battle for People's Park, Berkeley, 1969, Tom Dalzell, forward by Todd Gitlin, afterward by Steve Wasserman. Jim? Can you hear me okay? Am I on? Please start, you're on. All right. During the 1960s, when hope and anger and a sense of justice burned in young people, even as the government drummed away at patriotism and drafted 18 year old boys to fight a murderous losing war against a fourth world culture of Asian farmers in Vietnam, 24 buildings on the block behind the Cafe Mediterranean on Telegraph Avenue in Berkeley were demolished by the university using eminent domain laws. The battle for People's Park began. A number of students lived in these buildings because they were run down and therefore affordable. The regents and Governor Ronald Reagan wanted a show of force against rebels led by quotes, outside agitators, communists in short. Clearly these were the same bullying tactics as in the draft, as in the whole war effort. The ideals, the planning, the actions, the murder of James Rector, the gassing and wounding of young demonstrators are all in this stunning book. Filled to the voices and photos of who were there, Wendy Schlesinger, Dan Siegel, Steve Wasserman, Sim Vanderine, Paul Goodman, Barbara Rhine, Max Shear, who was editor of the Berkeley Barb, Jerry Rubin, Tom Hayden, Julia Vinograd, our old bubble girl, Stu Albert, Judy Gumbel, Jean Schoenfeld, Dr. Hippocrates, students, children, street activists, shop standing against bayonets and shotguns. These were the true patriots who wanted to see a more just America. Their names now faded, many now gone, but brought to intense life here in their own words and images. You want to know about Berkeley in the 60s? Here it is, a battle between those who dreamt of freedom and those who were willing to kill for capitalism. And how did we get to here from there with Donald Trump? So I was there. I will, I understood that and I part of it and I felt it. Tom Dalzell is the editor and main writer in this book, a man who gave 12 years working for the United Farm Workers of Cesar Chavez, he and his book richly deserve this special NCBR recognition award for Tom. Tom? Yes, do you hear me? Could you, can you accept the award? I can. Um, do you hear me? Yes, yes. You, you're fine. Please. You see me? No. Well, Mark, that, that's uh, far less important. The, um, in, the, in this book, I, my voice is almost absent. Um, there are first person accounts um, by more than 400 people who are there on all sides uh, of this. And I let the reader um, triangulate the, the data points and, and find their own truth. And I, I think the truth is that it was a really noble attempt at a coalition of all the elements that existed in Berkeley at the time, the community, uh, activists, students, faculty, um, the Black Panthers, um, to build something positive. And um, it was a, a glorious moment of hope. Uh, again, I let the, the, the photographs and the voices from then speak for themselves. I, I would just like to acknowledge a couple of people without whom this was not possible. Steve Wasserman, Heyday Press publisher, was a uh, student at Berkeley High at the time and, and very, very involved in 
uh, the building and, and Battle for People's Park. Michael Delacour um, conceived the park on April 15th. Uh, he still is in Berkeley uh, carrying family members and battling for the park. Um, Donovan Rundle um, was a first, first semester freshman, got shot from 20 yards. Um, 50 years and 40 operations later, he is still scarred um, by it. Um, James Rector, of course, and, and Alan Blanchard, who was, who was blinded and um, who died without telling his, his daughters or wife how it is that he was blinded. Um, it was a time of hope and, um, and despair, and it's, it's, it's a glorious story. And I was a, I was a seismograph here. I was not a writer in the truest sense of the word. Um, it's, it's an honor for this, um, to receive this award and on behalf of those who were there and scarred and those who struggle, I accept the award. Thank you, Tom. Thank you so much. Now, the nominees in children's literature, younger readers, are The Important Thing About Margaret Wise Brown, Mac Barnett, illustrated by Sarah Jacoby. This beautifully illustrated picture book celebrates the unconventional life of one of our most beloved children's book authors and illustrators. Barnett isn't afraid to get meta in his storytelling as he tells the story of her life. Wise Brown wrote over 100 books in her short life, including Goodnight Moon and The Runaway Bunny. Between Us and Abula, a family story from the border, Mateli Perkins, illustrated by Sarah Palacios, La, Las Posadas Sin Fronteras, the Inn Without Borders is celebrated along the border between Mexico and the US right before Christmas. Families reunite in Tijuana and San Diego on opposing sides of the border fence. A mother takes her two young children to the celebration to see their grandmother who lives in Mexico. The family story told through the children's creative triumph proves that love is stronger than any border. Brave with Beauty, a story of Afghanistan. Maxine Rose Schur, art by Patricia Gersh, Robin DeWitt, and Golsha Yagubi. Seven centuries ago, while her brothers played at being warriors, a little girl turned away from war and fell in love with poetry, music, calligraphy, painting, and the sciences, proudly proclaiming when her brothers mocked her that she was brave with beauty. When she grew up, she married the king of the empire, which stretched from Turkey to China, ruling it by herself after her husband's death and becoming arguably the most powerful woman in world history. The award for children's literature, Younger Readers goes to Brave with Beauty, a story of Afghanistan, Maxine Rose Schur. Maxine, could you accept the award? Yes, thank you so much. <laughs> um, I'm absolutely thrilled. Um, you know, in the 1970s, I visited Afghanistan and I felt I had traveled back in time. I felt that I had traveled in some ways back to the Middle Ages. In Afghanistan, there was no railroad. There were very few cars. And in the city of Herat, where I lived, people traveled by horse and buggy. And from the North came the Turkmen the rug sellers on camels. Shops were lit by oil lanterns and food was cooked over open fires and along the mud street sat scribes writing letters for the illiterate. In Herat, I saw the dilapidated tomb of an Afghan queen and the ruins of a woman's college she had built. And I wondered, who was she? I had never heard of her before. So over the years, I was led across the stepping stones from wonder to research, to discovery, to surprise, to knowledge. I learned there had once been an Afghanistan far removed from the poor, chaotic, medieval seeming country that we see on television. The 15th century Persian Timurid dynasty was a grand one and it stretched over a vast empire. 
its rulers were known for their lavish patronage of the arts, and the greatest of these patrons was Queen Gohar Shad. She was herself an architect, and she enthusiastically supported all the arts. During her reign, poetry, music, painting, calligraphy, architecture, and science as well, by the way, her son was a famous astronomer, flourished as never before. In fact, in the late 1400s, Herat was known as the Florence of Asia. In Brave with Beauty, this is what I wanted to convey. Afghanistan's little known lost world of high culture and spectacular beauty. And that in this Muslim world rose women of astonishing foresight, talent, and power. I am grateful to the Northern California Book Reviewers Association for this award. Stories arise from a passion to tell. So I'm grateful not just for this award, but for the opportunity to tell for even these few moments about Queen Goharshad and her world. And I'll read you that just the first few sentences of the book. Seven centuries ago, when the great caravans journeyed to the edges of the world, there lived a girl who loved all things of beauty. Her name was Goharshad. Her older brothers played at being conquerors. They wanted to be like Genghis Khan, a warrior so fierce on the battlefield that he would be remembered for thousands of years. Goharshad didn't care a fig for war. What she liked best was to imagine beautiful things to draw. With her little ivory box of paints, she would then paint the pictures she saw in her mind. Goharshad brothers mocked her. You play at nonsense, they taunted. You're soft and fearful as a rabbit, but we're hard and brave as soldiers. It's true. I am not good with arrows or spears, she replied, but I am brave. I am brave with beauty. Her brothers howled with laughter. What you say makes no sense. One of them grabbed her papers, crumpled them into a ball and threw it to his brother who promptly flung it out the window. The two ran back to their games. Gohar Shah did not cry. And though she did not know exactly what brave with beauty meant, she vowed, I will not be afraid. Not now, not ever. One day I will make the most beautiful things in the world. Thank Wonderful. you. Wonderful, thank you so much. The nominees in children's literature middle grade are The First Dinosaur, how Science Solved the Greatest Mystery on Earth. Ian Lendler, illustrator, C.M. Butzler. Butzer. In a fantastic mixture of reportage, detection, curiosity, and humor, Lendler leads his readers through the history of the idea of a dinosaur, from the discovery of bones to the complicated recreation of skeletons. And finally, the conception of dinosaur life. Emmy in the Key of Code, Amy Lucido. Loneliness, self-discovery, a community of interest and a gifted teacher meet in these pages to drive a work that's as satisfying as it is unique. Lucido pioneers a new multimedia form built of free verse, computer code, graphic invention and musical motifs to immerse us in the unfolding story and simultaneously in the intellectual and emotional development of 12-year-old Emmy. Extraordinary birds. 11-year-old December has scars on her back. She believes are wings that will soon let her fly away from the round of foster homes that define her life. But with time, a new school friend, Sherilyn, and the aid of a wounded hawk, December is able to come to terms with her grief and learn about the value of roots and home in this engaging and beautifully detailed story. The award for children's literature middle grade is Emmy in the Key of Code, Amy Lucido. Amy, are you there? Wonderful. I, I'm here, oh my gosh, thank you. Thank you so <laughs> Please get. Wow, I uh, I genuinely was not expecting this at all. I'm like kind of shaking right now. Thank you so much. Um, I, you know, people ask me if this book is an autobiography and I think it's because the name Emmy is so similar to the name Amy. 
Um, and it wasn't intended to be that way at all, but I think I think everything we write is a little bit autobiographical. Um, and I think with Emmy, that's particularly true because so much of who I am is really in this story because Emmy is somebody who comes from a musical background, um, but finds artistry in computer code. And I've always sort of had two sides of me. I've been a software engineer and I've been an author. Um, and, I, and people have always said like, you should write something that combines as you. And I was like, I'm never gonna do that. Um, but with with this story, I, I, the story came to me because I was reading another novel in verse, The Red Pencil by uh, Andrea Davis Pinckney. And something about how the book was written reminded me of computer code, which is strange because the book has nothing to do with computer science. And I had this idea to tell a story that was a combination of poetry and computer code. Because I think people think of computer code as like this really robotic thing with ones and zeros and it's hard to understand. Um, but people can think of poetry in kind of a similar way because people can be intimidated by it. They can think it's hard to understand also. Um, and so I decided to sort of combine the two and tell a story in poetry and code because code isn't anything more than language and poetry isn't anything more than language. I mean, they're both they're both meaningful language. They're both beautiful languages. And so I wanted to tell a story that highlighted the artistry of um, computer science. Um, I'm gonna read a really brief passage um, in the story. Um, so Emmy is new in school. She lives in San Francisco. Um, and when you're new at school, at least when I was new at school, the hardest part was lunchtime because you never know where you were gonna sit. Um, but Emmy has, she, she has music to kind of keep her company. And so this, is, this poem is called, If You Close Your Eyes. The Beatles, the Monkeys, the Turtles, the Cars, Madonna, Rihanna, Adele, Bruno Mars, Schubert and Schumann and Chopin and Bach, Spamalot, Hamilton, Rent, Schoolhouse Rock, the Vienna Boys Choir, the Philharmonic, Yo-Yo Ma, Miley Cyrus, Taylor Swift, and my favorite, Lady Gaga. <clears throat> so maybe I have no friends and eat under the stairs, but wearing my headphones, I kind of don't care. When I have music, nothing matters at all, and anywhere, everywhere can be Carnegie Hall. Thank you so much. I want to give a really quick thank you to the Northern California Book Reviewers and also the team at Versify. Thank you so much. I'm like incredibly honored. Thank you. Next, we have the children's literature, older readers, young adult. The nominees are The Downstairs Girl, Stacy Lee. Atlanta, Georgia, 1890s. Joe Kwan lives secretly with her Chinese immigrant, maybe grandfather, in a basement originally excavated to house escaped slaves making their way north. Impeccably researched, suspenseful, and surprising, this complex story opens like a flower. Patron saints of nothing. Randy Rebuy. Jay thinks he knows what's next. A boring senior year of high school and then the University of Michigan. His plans are shattered and he is awakened when he learns that his Filipino cousin was killed, a victim of President Duterte's war on drugs. So Jay flies to the Philippines to investigate. What he finds forces him to reevaluate his attitudes toward country his family, his cousin, and himself in a story as harrowing as it is uplifting. The NCBA for Children's Literature Older Readers, YA, is Downstairs Girl, Stacy Lee. Stacy? Are you there, Stacy? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you so much, man. What an honor. Thank you so much. Um, the Downstairs Girl, for those of you who don't know, is about a Chinese girl who lives secretly in the basement and becomes the secret advice columnist whose often controversial columns begins to change Atlanta society. It was a joy to write and such an honor for you to choose my book, my, my little book about a Chinese girl trying to navigate Atlanta at the turn of the century where most of the people were either categorized as black or white and how does she fit into that? Um, 
I'm going to just read you the first chapter so you can, I mean, the first paragraph chapter would be a bit long. Just the first paragraph to give you a little flavor of what the book is about. One, being nice is like leaving your door wide open. Eventually, someone's going to mosey in and steal your best hat. Me, I only have one hat and it is uglier than a smashed crow. So if someone stole it, the joke would be on their head, literally. Still, boundaries must be set, especially boundaries over one's worth. Today, I will demand a raise. So that begins uh, Joe's journey as a secret advice columnist. Um, I just wanna thank the San Francisco Public Library where I actually conducted a lot of my research um, into Atlanta 1890s, the issues um, going on during that time period, suffrage, uh, segregation, Jim Crow laws, it's all in there. Um, we just celebrated the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, um, giving women the right to vote, but I don't think a lot of people knew that uh, women of color didn't receive the vote until 1960s. So this is one of the issues that Joe addresses and uh, the San Francisco Library was very helpful for me to understand all the, all the details um, surrounding that issue. I wanna thank the uh, Northern California book reviewers and all the sponsors and of course my publisher Putnam um, and my family for accepting me the way I am. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Stacey. In translation, we have poetry, poetry in translation. The nominees are Sunday Sparrows, Song Lin, translated from the Chinese by Jamie Proctor Zhu. Jailed during the Tietnamen protests, poet Song Lin is a survivor and this new translation testifies to his resilience. He draws on Chinese poetry, European and New World literary traditions. Even simple pieces embody complex interactions between the real and the surreal. Song Lin wields surrealism as a weapon of indirect but powerful social commentary. Skillfully translated, these poems offer a glimpse of an important voice in contemporary Chinese culture. The Fire's Journey, part four, the return. Eunice Odio, translated from Spanish by Keith Ikes, by Keith Ikes, Sonia P. Ticas, and Mauricio Espinoza. The return completes the four volume lyric epic that delves into the primordial act of the word as creation, the journey of the wordsmith as creator. On par with William Blake and his prophecies, Odio builds the mythic, the mytho-poetic world of Ion with Greek mythology, New World shamanism, and mythic invention. The poet hero returns home to a mixed reaction that puts his personal heroism as, as the bearer of the poetic wor word into communal perspective. His encounters reveal the psychological complexities faced by the poet creator who works in isolation. The poet herself lived a peripatetic life in Central America, Mexico, and US. The translators have wonderfully recreated this dramatic poem. The award for translation and poetry goes to Sunday Sparrows. Song Lin, translated by Jamie Proctor Zhu. So, um, are you here, Jamie? Yeah, I'm here. Wonderful, please accept your award. We're so glad to have you here. Yeah, thank you so much. This is such a huge honor. Um, I just want to thank um, Song Lin, first of all, for trusting me with his poems and for his friendship. and. He also was really thrilled um, to be recognized um, uh, by this award. It means a lot to him. 
Um, so I just also want to thank my friends and my family um, here in China and around my world, around the world, um, especially my son Dylan and my parents and also my partner Simon. And thank you to my Bay Area poetry families and, and my the acknowledgements I forgot to thank Bob Haas and Brenda Hillman. So I want to thank them here and also thank you to Zephyr Press. And also today I want to acknowledge Jack Hirschman who's been a mentor and like family. So it means a lot to win this today um, when he's receiving his award. Um, I think of translation as an act of peacemaking as governments threaten to cut people off from one another, building walls and trying to block apps that people use to stay in touch with friends, families and fellow artists. Poems and stories and translation create bridges. Um, so I really wanna thank um, the award organizers for acknowledging translation and its importance, and also for this award. Um, this collection includes poems that Songlin wrote over a period of 30 years, and he's a combination of an artist, poet, storyteller, and philosopher, and you can really see all those aspects of himself and his thinking and his poems. Um, he's been a major poet in China since the 1980s, and this was a real labor of love, so um, this is a real honor. So um, I'm going to read um, uh, maybe one poem for a time. Um, uh, from the collection. Uh, this was a poem that he wrote in 1989 in Shanghai. Chrysanthemums on the sea. Sprinkle the seeds sprouted in the mirror onto the sea. Put the sword away. The sword is emanating heat in the seawater. The chrysanthemums are in bloom. The books have fallen off the shelves. Three nightingales simultaneously fly out from the mirror. What is this that feels so frightened and shaken? Who is it on the leaking rubber boat, so frightened and shaken? My throat catches a sword falling from the sky. From the firmament, I enter the world, then sink back down sleepwalking among mountains of immortals and the bright moon above the sea. Um, yeah, so I just wanna say like, thank you again. Um, like I've been a member of the Bay Area writing community and translating community and like, um, yeah, I felt the support and love of so many people. So just thank you so much. This is such an honor. Thank you, Jamie, thank you so much. Next, we have translation and fiction. The nominees are A Devil Comes to Town, Paolo Marenzig, translated from the Italian by Anne Milano Appel. Marenzig's debut novel, The Lundberg Variation, sold 2 million copies in Italy and was translated into 25 languages. In this clever, funny, and riveting tale, the teller is compelled to tell a traveler he meets at an inn his whole story so that what has befallen him has been recorded. This is a more than competent and fluent translation by Anne Milano Appel. And Marense gives us a riveting plot twist at the end of this tale of self-interest, overweening competitive ambition, and our deep need for stories. Mephisto's Waltz, Selected Short Stories, Sergio, Sergio Pitol, translated from the Spanish by George Henson. Sergio Pitol grew up sickly with his aristocratic grandmother on their remote hacienda in Mexico, surrounded by books that took him to the far corners of the earth. He studied law and philosophy in Mexico City and spent many years as ambassador or cultural attache in Poland, Hungary, China, Italy, and France. The further he traveled, the more he blurred boundaries between the fantastic and the real. George Henson provides us with an elegant and entertaining introduction to an important Mexican writer. 
The word of the speechless selected stories. Julio Ramon Ribeiro, edited and translated from the Spanish by Catherine Silver. Peruvian writer Julio Ramon Ribeiro, 1929 to 1994, was a master of the short story, fashioning setting, character, and events into tales that unveil the depths of human longing and delusion. Catherine Silver offers us this multifaceted writer in a deft and delightful translation. The NCBA in Translation Fiction Award goes to The Word of the Speechless Selected Stories. Julio Ramon Ribeiro, translated by Catherine Silver. Hi, now it's Anissa. It's Anissa. Catherine Silver would like to regret she's unable to attend today, but thanks, thanks, thanks. Yes, thanks. thank you, thank you, Catherine, uh, for this wonderful translation. And um, onward, it's a great book. They are all wonderful. General nonfiction. The nominees are The Invention of Yesterday, a 50,000 year history of human culture, conflict and connection. Tamim Ansari. Who were we and what shall we become? What does the singularity portend? It seems impossible to cover so much in a single book, but here it is, beautifully written by a master craftsman. Ansari is African American, having come to the US when he was a teen. His comprehension, particularly of Middle East and Far Eastern history, is detailed and extensive. He brings much information that is refreshingly non-Western to this book. It's a book to be read again and again. The Dreamt Land, Chasing Water and Dust Across California, Mark Eriks. Almonds, figs, walnuts, nectarines, pomegranates, eventually it all comes down to water. Concurrent with the depiction of the greed of big farmers and their increasing need for water is the story of its depletion and of the attempts to contain it in California. Arax introduces us to fascinating individuals from the Central Valley, his home in the heart of agricultural California. He takes us on many byways to tell the story of the importance of water to every aspect of our lives in this dreamt land of California. Elderhood, redefining aging, transforming medicine, Reimagining Life, Louise Aronson. Louise Aronson, an accomplished writer as well as a ger geriatric doctor, has used her talents and skills to write this book, combining her passionate interest in the lives of our society's elders with her knowledge and experience of the medical aspects of growing old. This part memoir is filled with accurate medical knowledge. Aronson has done a great service in giving us this very readable work. It shines a powerful light on the future that awaits us in the hope that this future might be changed with awareness. Super Pumped, The Battle for Uber, Mike Isaac. Mike Isaac's grip, gripping saga of the rise and fall of Travis Kalanick CEO of the startup car ride company, Uber, reads like a medieval morality tale. The book traces Kalanick's trajectory from his middle-class home in Northridge, California, to his milestone, Anything Goes, Las Vegas Party, X to the X, to his eventual fall from power. Isaac gifts his readers with a wonderfully written and compelling narrative revealing the dark side of contemporary America's capitalist culture. The Curious World of Seaweed, Josie 
Isselin. This exquisitely illustrated book immerses its readers in a fascinating world of flora we often take for granted. Isolin combines extensive historical research with many years of her own meticulous observations of the sea's bounty, the kelp, algae, seagrass, eelgrass, and other species we see as we walk our coastal beaches. She gives us an expansive understanding of the importance of these diverse aquatic forests to our endangered ecosystem. The award for general nonfiction goes to The Dreamt Land, Mark Eriks. Are you here, Mark? I believe I am, am I? You are. Yes. Wonderful. Is, it's very sweet news. What a, what a list of nominees. Thank you so much. Um, well, this is a, obviously a weird time to be holding a book award ceremony. Uh, it was weird because of the pandemic, and it's only gotten weirder because of the wildfires, the smoke, the heat wave, and the blackouts. Um, but I also know this. I have a 21-year-old son who suffers from a sometimes debilitating case of anxiety, and he's gotten through the past six months by reading Dostoevsky, Pushkin, and Soroyan. So if we ever needed a reminder that books are a tether, a, a lifeline, an anchor, um, I've certainly been reminded of it now. Uh, I want to thank NCBR for this award. It's, you guys have really built a very special book culture up there in the Bay Area, and that is to be cherished. And thank you so much. I was born in Fresno. I'm right here in Fresno. I've lived here most of my life. Uh, figuring out this place isn't easy. I've, I've written in the neighborhood. I, I think I was counting up a million published words trying to get close. And in this book, uh, water became a means and a, and a metaphor to try to pry open the soul of the state, if that, if that doesn't sound too highfalutin. Um, We've taken, we took from the native tribes a landmass a thousand miles long, a hundred million acres, and we called it one state. Highest mountain, lowest desert, longest coast, most epic valley, riparian forest, redwood forest, Douglas fir forest, wetland, grassland, and inland sea, each its own state of nature. What to do when the lines of latitude cover 10 degrees and the rain falls 125 inches on one end and seven inches on the other. And the people in their wisdom choose to live where the water isn't. And so began the infinite tinkering to even out the differences. The people corralled the snowmelt dam the rivers, move the rain, and then moved the earth. The proposition of California, its projection has always been too big for its britches. You can look at the magnitude of that ambition and conclude that California suffers from a congenital defect. It is fated for apocalypse. That may be true but it's also true that the scale of our invention, our genius and our tragedy has required us to keep reinventing. And it is those reinventions that become not just our future, but America's future. I'm reminded that California has made a fool of many doomsayers. That said, this book wonders if maybe we are fast approaching a limit line. In my lifetime, we've gone from 14 million Californians to 40 million Californians. And that last drought, if not these current wildfires, shows that we have these cracks in our system 
and we're going to have to reinvent ourselves anew. Uh, times like this, I'm, I'm, I think of my grandfather, Aram Arox. He was a survivor of the Armenian genocide. He arrived in this valley in 1920, and he did what all good poets do. He was a poet. In fact, Arox is a pen name. He got on his hands and knees and he started picking crops. And when I was 15 and my father was murdered here in Fresno, my grandfather became, stepped in and became my mentor. And I think I would not have become a writer without him. So uh, thank you very much. I appreciate this greatly. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now for creative nonfiction. The nominees are The Sixth Man, Andre Iguadala. Those who live in the Bay Area know who Andre Iguadala is and what role he played on the Golden State Warriors. This book displays that public figure, but also introduces us to some of the quieter and more revealing aspects of his life. This memoir, written with Carvel Wallace, takes Iguadala from his days growing up in Springfield, Illinois, to his warrior years. Finally, there's the title, Iguadala's Willingness to Be the Sixth Man for the Championship Warriors, a role he found difficult to embrace, yet a role he deftly turned into his key position as emotional ballast for, for the team. Socialist realism, Trisha Lowe. A young Asian woman, Trisha Lowe, was brought to America from Singapore by her parents to experience new things. She found a dead whale, the talented Mr. Ripley, the un unanswerable questions about what freedom is and isn't. She tries waterboarding as an SM performance and experiences gay love and by love. She realizes that living is a lot harder than dying. How to do nothing, resisting the attention economy, Jenny O'Dell. An NCBR reader wrote, I once visited a friend in a housing development in San Jose. Before this was all built, my host said, waving at the identical houses and denuded landscape, there was nothing here. This is the book I wish I had given him. Odell's discussion incorporates everyone from Diogenes in fourth century Athens to Henry David Thoreau to a performance artist who locked himself in a cage for a year. Odell is not interested in blanket condemnations and does not suggest we delete social media. Rather, she suggests we engage in a mass movement of attention so that a commons that is at once physical and imaginal can come into being. Whose story is this? Old Conflicts, New Chapters, Rebecca Solnit. Nobody can kick ass and at the same time write a beautifully balanced English sentence like Rebecca Solnit. In these 20 essays, Solnit roams the surreal landscape of the Trump era in order to, in her own words, record the seismic activity in feminism, racial justice, climate action, and other human rights movements that, have, that has arisen in response to constant assaults upon women, immigrants, BIPOC, Black Indigenous people of color, non-binary people, and upon our very allegiance to truth itself. The Collected Schizophrenias, Esme Weijung Wang, these essays mix memoir, reportage, and scientific research with philosophic asides about self, identity, illness, madness, and sanity, however ineptly understood or lived. 
Collected refers to Wang's multiple approaches to the issue of what it is to live as, be seen as, and write as someone with schizoid affective disorder. How should she dress to look sane? What movies can she safely see without activating her demons? It's hard not to be astounded at the fact that this book exists, let alone how complex, thoughtful, frank, and lyric the stories become in Wang's capable hands. Creative nonfiction goes to the collected schizophrenias, Esme Weizhang Wang. Are you here, Hi. Esme? I am here. Wonderful. Um, I <laughs> Um, I am so honored um, to be awarded this prize. Um, I did not write a speech. Um, that is how surprised I am. Um, I started to think about writing this book when I was diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder after eight years of experiencing um, symptoms. I was looking everywhere for a book that might tell me a little bit about this diagnosis that I had just been given and I could not find anything. All I could find were books that um, were either really thick and dense and made for clinicians and scientists and made no sense for somebody who had received a diagnosis. I did find one book that was a little bit useful and I found it on Amazon of all places and it had a very ugly clip art cover. And so I told myself that it might be time for me to write a book. Um, the first essay that I actually wrote was for um, the toast, uh, rest in peace toast uh, for those of you who might remember this website and I remember uh, the essay was called Perdition Days and one of the most memorable comments that I received for that particular essay was from somebody who said my father died a number of years ago I felt I never knew him he had a diagnosis of schizophrenia and after reading your essay, I feel that I might finally understand who he might have been for the first time. And I thought that was something I might never have been able to get in my lifetime. Um, and so I just want to thank, um, first of all, um, the, the awardees of this award. I'm so grateful to you and for the San Francisco Public Library um, from whom I have received so many books uh, during this quarantine. Um, I would like to thank Jen and the Wiley Agency who are such wonderful um, representatives. I would like to thank Grey Wolf Press for taking a risk on me um, and for uh, the nonfiction book award uh, this is a result of the nonfiction book award and I am so grateful to them and for Steve Woodward who was my editor on this particular book and to everyone who has purchased and read and borrowed this book from libraries and helped make this book um, go into its eighth printing. I was just notified last week that it is going into its eighth printing, which is something that I am immensely grateful for. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Here to present the NCBR Groundbreaker Award is NCBR member Amy Glynn. Amy? Are you here, Amy? Amy Glynn? I am. Yes, I am. Wonderful. Please Hi. start. All right. You can hear me okay, right? Yes. I got one of those terrifying no, your internet connection is unstable things. So <laughs> you're great. All right. <clears throat> Her own website's bio notes that she embraces the fool energy of the poet life. But when most of us think of Kim Shuck, I have to say fool is probably not the first word that leaps to mind. Uh, warrior strikes me as the likelier archetype, though to be sure she is the kind of warrior whose quiver also contains the fool's go-to projectiles of humor and wonder and expansiveness. I, indeed, I'd be likely to describe her to a stranger as the kind of person who doesn't suffer fools gladly. Watching Kim disagree with someone is like getting a master class in integrity and boundaries. She listens carefully, considers all information, acknowledges the other person's perspective, and then stands her ground with the kind of quiet force that makes me think of the way mountains create their own weather. 
She's a thoughtful person, one with the ability to think with her hands as well as her brain, as anyone knows who has seen her beadwork or weaving. Someone who understands the value of craft and also knows that craft is inherently social, something that derives meaning from being shared in community with others. Her prosody shows these virtues too. In reading Kim Shuck's poems, it is possible to hear something akin to the tiny sound of beads clicking together along a thread. There is a pensive, litanical, high tension quality to her work. Listen to this short poem, It's Not an Act of Patience. Forging snakeskin, fur, and what was that exact angle of head, animal working me out, eat it, be eaten, or complete, perhaps ignore. There is always an urgency here, a thing that rings you, not some abstraction of other awareness, but the primary song of a thing, the exact note of passion or pain or satiation, that song made of single and multi-element constructions of plastic modeling, of red ochre's caress of the skin. You have to fall in love, really, no other way. Kim received a BA in art and an MFA in textiles from San Francisco State University. She's the author of Deer Trails, Clouds Running In, Rabbit Stories, and Smuggling Cherokee, as well as the chat book collection, Sidewalk Indian. She currently works at the California College of Art in the diversity department. Kim Shuck has blazed a new trail for being a poet laureate of any place. A multi-generational native of San Francisco, she is a maverick, an innovator, someone who brought people into the circle in San Francisco who might never have felt included there before. Shuck launched Seeds, creating poetic activism, a seed program for poets to grow writing and reading series audiences in their own communities across the city. Her Fire Thieves poetry series has brought together intriguing intersectional, multi-generational lineups of writers, reminding us that we are always, as poets and as people, in a dialogue with our own past as well as the future. Kim's tireless commitment to poetry has earned her a number of distinctions, including an inaugural National Laureate Fellowship from the Academy of American Poets, the Penn Oakland Censorship Award, KQED's Local Hero Award, the Native Writers of America's first book, Diane DeCora Award, and the Mary Tall Mountain Award. The Northern California Book Awards do not give out the Groundbreaker Award every year. As Joyce Jenkins told me, we do it only when necessary. Today it is necessary, and I'm honored to introduce the 2020 recipient of the Groundbreaker Award, the deeply engaged, tirelessly creative, and stalwart poet laureate of San Francisco, Ms. Kim Shuck. Kim. I'm really going to need a copy of that. <laughs> <laughs> I really, really am. Um, I'd just like to start by saying I am coming to you from, um, oh, that's my least favorite picture ever. Okay. Um, I'm coming to you from uh, Ramatish Ohlone territory. And uh, we need to remember where we are when we're in a place. Um, I really appreciate this. I, I didn't write anything because um, I figured I was so uncomfortable already. Why not work without a net? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing left to lose. I, I've had great examples of people who were tireless. Carolee Sanchez, um, who did a lot of things in the Bay Area poetically. Um, Mary Tall Mountain, who, whose award I received. Um, but none of this stuff would be possible without the amazing support of really a lot of the poetic community in the Bay Area. Um, uh, Thea Matthews, uh, I'm picturing somebody whose name I cannot remember right now. Um, my partner, my family, my parents who still live here, uh, the grandmother who used to always wonder out loud why my poems didn't rhyme, um, the crappy poetry teacher from high school, the high school in San Francisco who keeps asking me to, to uh, say who they were so that they could brag about it. But to be honest, I think I started writing in spite of them rather than because of them. So that might not be a great idea. Um, I probably don't suffer fools gladly. I, I, I think 
that button's probably stuck on me and it may be a congenital problem or it might have been inherited from some fairly determined women that I'm descended from, including one who, who ran moonshine and used to face down judges all the time. There is something to being descended from people who have faced and um, managed to kick the can down the road, the whole issue of genocide. And I have that on both sides of the family. So um, I don't know that I can take credit for, for much of this. Paul Corman Roberts, J.K. Fowler, Eric Whittington, Joyce herself. I have so many people to be grateful for. Um, and uh, I'm just, well, all I'm doing is participating in the community. People get that, right? It, it's never about cults of personality. It's always got to be about um, participating with other people who you can participate with. Some of them won't let you. Right, because the other thing that's happened to me since I got named poet laureate of San Francisco is that I've had a death threat. Although to be honest, I'd put that on my resume if I could figure out how, because I think it defines who disagrees with you. And when people who are overtly stating that they are racist disagree with you, that's probably something I should make space for in what I have to say about myself. I no longer work at the California College of Arts. They failed to rehire me, partially, probably, because I mouth off a lot. Um, but if, if you're in respectful conversation with people and you challenge them, there's a way in which that's kind of a gift. So um, I never take it terribly personally. And I hope other people don't either. I'm going to stop doing this. I, I'm glad people enjoy my work and I'm glad people enjoy the work that I've done as the Poet Laureate. Um, I think there are a lot of great people up for it for the next time and that San Francisco is a place worthy of the best you can give when you're representing her in any way. It's a special peninsula. It's a special day, and there are a lot of special people who wash up here. So thank you again, Joyce, the thank library, you. everybody, um, everybody I forgot to mention. Um, I'm really quite grateful for this, and, uh, and, and I'm really uncomfortable when I'm receiving awards. Um, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Kim. Thank you so much. Thank you for all of your beautiful work. And it has been deeply significant. Now for fiction. The, NCAA, the NCBA award in fiction. The nominees are The Parade, Dave Eggers. The parade is set along construction the parade is set along a construction route in the aftermath of civil war in an unnamed country. As part of the peacetime treaty, this new road will, will un, unite the impoverished and isolated South with the more developed North, a plan with logistical and conceptual benefits for all, supposedly. This novel might at first read as a moral tale against development but it goes further, implicating benevolent outsider influences, anonymity, and blind trust. Here, Dave Eggers writes, a bold, minimalist, and timeless allegory. The Warm South, Paul Kirshen. Poor John Keats, so epically talented and so doomed. What if he hadn't died at 25? Paul Kirshen's The Warm South presents an alternate timeline version of the tubercular superbard in which he survives his illness, leaves Joseph Severin at his easel and traverses Italy, becoming re-engaged with his medical training and surprisingly embroiled in local politics. This is a masterful meditation 
on a writer who has transfixed us for well over a century. But more than that, it's a meditation on our relationship with our own creative impulses. The Atlas of Reds and Blues, Devi S. Laskar. A woman lies in a driveway, bleeding from a gunshot wound inflicted by police. This moment is one from which panoplies of other moments stretch back and forward in time. An immigrant story, a meditation on race in America, a treatise on family baggage, intergenerational tensions, gender politics, marital power dynamics. It unfurls in short, fast moving fragments. This is a poet's novel, one that leverages the, the stochastic, the piecemeal and out of time, but it's also swift moving, plain spoken, a laundry list of grievances that accrue predict predictably and are no less unnerving for it. The Revisioners, Margaret Wilkerson Sexton. This beautifully written novel is told from the dual perspectives of Ava, a biracial single mother, and her great great grandmother, Josephine, who was raised in slavery and is introduced as an elderly widow. She has been a sharecropper, owns her own farm, and is the strength and nexus of her community. When she is befriended by a lonely, abused white woman, her family is rightfully suspicious. The reader sees Josephine as a slave child in 1855, during the time her family plans their escape. It is through her that we learn of other ancestors channeling powers in the weight of racism through generations. Sexton uses the multi-generational woven narrative to great advantage. Machine, Susan Steinberg, Susan Steinberg's unsettling novel, Machine, dazzles and challenges the reader with form and content. The tiny tales of the ubiquitous slippery semicolons hiss the summer story of the accidental show off, we don't know, drowning of a local girl. Impossible to categorize, impossible to put down. Machine haunts long after the boats are put away long after the interlopers are returned and sequestered in private schools and legacy colleges, longer after snow covers the dead asleep in the frozen ground. The award for fiction goes to the warm south, Paul Kirshen. Are you here, Paul? Uh, I, I am. Uh, I'm, I'm here and truly uh, shocked and startled. I was not expecting this and also don't have much in the way of prepared remarks. Um, thanks very much to the uh, reviewers, to the library, um, to Roundabout Press, who um, uh, took a chance on a, a known author. And um, it, it's a real privilege to be um, among this, uh, a, a really remarkable list of uh, nominees as a first time novelist from a, from a very small press. Um, uh, it's also just great to, to see everyone here this um, in this past week, especially I, has been so absurd and terrifying. Uh, this reminder of, a, of a, the presence of a literary community is, is really fantastic. Um, uh, this book is also uh, about a, uh, another literary community during a, a difficult time, uh, in addition to John Keats, or my alternate version of John Keats. Uh, as the protagonist, uh, Percy Shelley, Mary Shelley, Lord Byron, and many other uh, lesser known names in that circle are also, um, uh, are also present um, in, in 1821, as, as many of you uh, probably know. It's only a few years after Napoleon was defeated, and you have uh, reactionary repressive governments uh, being put in place uh, across Europe, both back in England, where you would have uh, soldiers uh, actually massacring crowds of peaceful protesters. Um, in, uh, on the continent, you had uh, various uh, reactionary absolute monarchies being put in place. Uh, eventually, you'll um, get the, um, uh, the later 19th century where, where uh, serious reform that turns the uh, England into something like a modern democracy as, as well as the Italian unification. But uh, in 1821, none of that's really there yet. You have the, the romantic poets as, um, uh, 
as, as people working against their time, but not yet seeing the uh, what will be the fruits. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm, I'll just read the, the very uh, beginning of the book, uh, which is a short section called uh, Prologue in Hell. He died, but they turned the lock on his bones and shut the ghost inside. Everything had to go on as before. He discovered the persistence of walls, the dominion of furniture, look long enough into the ceiling, and the ceiling ends up inside you. I have not begun the last work, that of losing things. They fed him on milk and toast. They bled him from the neck, and they took away the cork-stoppered bottle of laudanum that he'd been saving in his travel chest under the paradise lost. Think of your soul, they said. He wept. That bottle, which he never uncorked, had been his last comfort. The pain cannot get worse. The pain did get worse every time. And the consolations of his soul went up in bonfires, except for the knowledge that he might kill it. He would swallow from the bottle only once and endure five seconds more. The five seconds stretched forward their fibers, became an hour, and his senses were cut away. I will tell you what is the life you've saved. The cough and hemorrhage you know, the night sweats are to come. The palpitations, the wasting diarrhea that empties the structure, you are tending a corpse. He couldn't draw a breath, his throat scorched. An ocean hung at his lips and he could not drink for weakness. He started awake at night with his sheets drenched and his heart skipping in him like something tumbling over ice. Instead of the old scarlet spittle, he now brought up a black vomit into the chamber pot, threaded with clots. Yet he always had enough blood to feel the leeches in the morning. How then could anyone believe in his death? The pain prowled him from side to side and scratched for its exit. He knew it as he'd known faces. His skin had begun to sag at the joints with a waxy cast as if ready to peel away. He could not play this game forever, always extending the same five seconds. Say farewell. His ambitions were forgotten. Friendship and love were fond, faraway dreams. Lay them into bed, let them drowse. His secrets were harder to let go, being his alone. That evening field of wheat dipping its stalks in the wind, will it not survive me? No, nor the very near things, the wall, the slant of yellow sun, Unwind them from your heart. This sheet and blanket are the span of your being. You lie still as a saint. Do not cling to breath, neither shrink from pain. The world spins outside your door, and from now on will have to answer its own questions. For you, there's a drowsing and letting go. He dreamed his death. A physician's scalpel slit him from sternum to navel, a violet track, the mark of poison, touched his innards. Was I betrayed? Someone laughed. You may go to law. Kindling was heaped under his palate and set alight. Everything he had touched in life must be burned. Deep in the earth, where the dead had their courtroom, up and down were turned about. Benches hung in rows above his head, and he clambered down an arched ceiling into the well of a dome. A crowd was gathered around a magistrate, and he shoved between their shoulders, calling, Who is not dead? Let him live. In fact, he was saying, I alone am living. Let me die. Since in the courtroom of the dead, every word had its meaning turned about. The pages in his hand were out of order. He could not read a single line from beginning to end, and everything was mixed in with his poems and plays, not his finished work, but the abandoned things he never brought to print. He tried to hide them against his breast, but a bailiff in riding clothes leaned from behind and said, ha, cockney poetry, the rare wild weed. On the far side of the crowd, there showed a woman's white hand, a color cool as water. To touch it would end him. He tried to reach around the bailiff, but the man's shoulders kept moving to block his way. Thou spoke the magistrate, unsay thy farewells. Sir, thou shalt take up each thread at the place it was dropped, ravel them back into the hole. The key turned in the lock, the bone cage cracked open. He was flung upward, tumbling fast as if rising from the bottom of the ocean. The blue arm of night flowed up his limbs, kissed his temples, and a trickle of snow touched his throat. He lifted his chest to suck and a torrent of ice poured into him. He was penetrated to the fingertips and could not be filled. What was this power? He was drowned, he was alive. With all his heart, he'd expected to be finished. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Poetry. This is such a strong list. The nominees are Locus, Jason Bayani. Jason Biani has built an impressive reputation as the dynamic Bay Area spoken word performer. In Locus, he is determined to tell about his life 
straddling Filipino and American cultures. One key dimension in Bayani's intriguing immigrant story is the role and function of hip hop culture in his life, music that beckoned and carried him towards civic awareness and artistic success. Few poets are capable of prophetic lines such as these from how do you love a gentrified city? Maybe tomorrow they'll throw tear gas into the street and we will teach them how to grieve properly. A little more red sun on the human, new and selected poems, Gillian Connolly. There are many innovative poets writing now freed in varying degrees from continuous discourse, description, argument, but very few of them deliver Connolly's sensual impact, cogency, her vivid language, her downright human importance. Among today's innovators, she flies virtually solo. Poem after poem, there's intuitive rightness to her words that yields something of the wonder of flocks of birds, schools of fish, varying in their mysterious unisons. Across her career too, her subjects range widely from her small town Texas youth through astronomy, politics, love poems, and more, all sumptuously imagined. Scar and Flower, Lee Herrick. Lee Herrick's third full-length collection creates a force field where Fatigue meets fire, where we wake and wonder what it means to be human, how the desire for good, for hope, continues to confront and to coexist with the unspeakably tragic and inhumane. I know all the lyrics, I know all the blood, I know why angels howl into the moonlight. As a Korean American adoptee, Herrick examines the idea of displacement in the body, in the heart, in the web of existence. A folio for the dark, Camille Norton. This brilliant collection takes us in and out of literal and metaphoric cap captivity, imprisonment and exile from inside ourselves, our homes, our histories, from our spiritual lives, from our bodies, our sexuality. Norton inhabits many lives here, from an inmate in a prison for Confederate soldiers, to Thomas Jefferson, to Melville's whale, to Poe, to Gertrude Stein, to her own painful childhood, where she discovers that I must sharpen, I must gather, I must read my way out. These poems explore, understand, and witness the mess we've been left and the mystery. A piece of good news, Katie Peterson. There's not a single poem in this attention grabbing book that moves smoothly from beginning to end like the hull of a ship. Instead, the poems move in bright loops through their courses. Her final poem, Paul Bowles, begins with a book of his, moves through the Norman word husband, younger, she says, than wife, and ends with, in times like these, no one asks for sugar. The effect is quirky, stimulating, and mysterious. Whatever may be withheld in these poems only sharpen the interest in what's given. Peterson's voice is probing, continually surprising, lyrically deft. Father's Day, Matthew Zapruder. On a macrocosmic level, Zapruder's new poems are filled with fear for America's future during this fraught political moment. Within the drama of his own intimate family situation, Zapruder explores the pain and fear of navigating family life after learning about his son's autism spectrum disorder diagnosis. With his characteristic wit and music crafted in short artful lines, Zapruder reminds us that we're the stewards of language and that even in a fallen world, 
We have a right to our own failures and desires. The award for poetry goes to A Little More Red Sun on the Human, Gillian Connolly. Are you here, Gillian? I am, and I'm wonderful. Speechless and really surprised. Thank you. Um, I don't have a speech. Uh, I want to thank Night Boat Books. Uh, this is a new and selected poems. So there are a couple of publishers involved. Night Boat uh, published the new and selected. I need to thank Omni Dawn Books, Wave books, Carnegie Mellon, um, gosh, and the uh, Northern California Book Reviewers, thank you so much. Uh, the library, uh, the whole Bay Area community that has been an amazing place to live and grow as a poet. I've been here since the late 80s. I know I have a Texas accent. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm a Californian by now. Um, such a tough time for California. It's been really beautiful to sit here and listen to all this great writing. I want to thank Joyce Jenkins for being so such a force and um, guiding us through all of this and um, just being there all of these years for so many of us as poets. Um, I'll read I, a poem, and uh, I'm really thrilled. Thank you so much. And I also want to uh, thank all of the other poetry nominees. It was an, it's an incredible list of poets. Okay, every epic. Every epic dreams it has been destroyed by catastrophe, a mass ego only properly exists in earthquakes and catastrophes. A mass ego is in music, the one song everyone loves. But the violence one has to incorporate is great. The joy is mighty. The one song everyone loves, loved. Every epic dreams, time is a water garden in a weedy churchyard. No hell in your draft. There are other terrors. I sleep, you sleep, he, she, it sleeps, you sleep, they sleep, we sleep. The incomparable moon chapter over my enemy. Strong leader dozes off in horizon's dank corridor. Calm nights along sensorium's riverbank. Objects freed of their utility, completely unmoored. And epic dreams, and one follows any adversary on land, any adversary in the bottom of the brain, an enemy sitting across from a lover, calmly editing a lover, her salad a mirage. A real world could come back to us as an epic, similar to a short while and a further example, ecstatic child leaning over a pickle barrel, a time bruise on the pickle barrel. A few masterpieces droop, an epic dreams in the ruinous thereof. Every epic dreams and one follows. As a figment in one setting beyond this earth even. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, now we have the Northern California Book Awards were co-founded by the late Fred Cody, legendary Berkeley bookseller and reviewer way back in 1981. He had an ulterior motive. He wanted more lunches to talk books. The award in his name has gone to an amazing array of our most stellar, from Alice Walker, Adrian Rich, and Maxine Hong Kingston, to Lawrence Ferlinghetti, Ishmael Reed, Daniel Ellsberg, and more. Tamim Ansari, nonfiction nominee this year, also received the Fred Cody. 
NCBR member, poet, and translator Stephen Kessler will present the Fred Cody Award for Lifetime Achievement in Service. Stephen? Stephen Kessler? Stephen? I'm, uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, I, I wasn't sure who was gonna unmute me, so I unmuted no, you're, my- No, you're fine, we can hear well, you. Well, it's, uh, it's, thank you, Joyce, for everything you do, and especially for inviting me to uh, present this award to Jack Hirschman, um, who as most of you probably know, has been a, a constant, uh, creative and extremely generous presence and force in the uh, poetry culture and community of the, or the communities, I should say, of the, uh, of the Bay Area. Um, Jack is a prolific poet, a prodigious translator. Um, I think he told me he has 45 books now from nine languages. Uh, in addition to his 50 something uh, books of original poetry, he's also been an editor of anthologies and magazines, um, an organizer of events like uh, poetry series. Uh, a lot of you have probably participated in his, uh, some of his library series. Um, cultural, political, events and demonstrations he's a he, he really walks the the talk of his uh political commitment and has been a constant advocate for peace and justice and the oppressed and the marginalized ever since uh he arrived in san francisco uh in 1972 so it's almost 50 years he's been at this um uh what else was I going to tell you? Um, in addition to all his sort of literary public accomplishments, um, he's been a friend and a mentor and a, a comrade and a colleague and an encourager of countless, countless poets uh, and has been just a tireless advocate for poetry as a, as a vital form of art and and of uh, political engagement, but uh, to his credit, he doesn't uh, he doesn't mistake. Uh, he he knows the difference between politics and poetry. He know, he knows where where the, where they come together, and um, it's just been an inspiration to know him for all these years that he's been working and practicing in San Francisco. He has been recognized as poet laureate. Um, in San Francisco several years ago. Otherwise, he's su pretty successfully stayed out of the mainstream. Uh, he's published consistently with uh, a lot of the kinds of small presses we see uh, publishing these books that have been nominated. Uh, he's he's just been, he's, he's a real hardcore, old school, radical bohemian artist. And his poetry <laughs> is full of, uh, Joycey and uh, jazz and just tremendous uh, verbal energy. And anyway, it's just, uh, I mean, I've been lobbying for this, you know, for Jack to get this award for years. And I'm so delighted to be able to um, present the Fred Cody Award for 2020 to my old friend, teacher, comrade, colleague, Jack Hirschman. Hi. Jack. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Hi, folks. Good to be with you all. Congratulations to all the winners of the, the book awards today. Uh, and thank you, Steve, Joyce, for inviting me originally to this or announcing this award. Good to be with a couple of very dear friends also, Kim Shuck and the Jami Tractor Shu, with whom I, I know very well what trips also we've taken to China to read in festivals in China. Um, let me say just to begin, and then I'll read a poem. 
a great American communist revolutionary, the late great Nelson Peary. I'll spell his name, N-E-L-S-O-N, P-E-E, P-E-E-R-Y, who's written Black Fire and Black Radical, said that the American Revolution will occur through a mass uprising. Well, this year we have experienced with the death of George Floyd, the actual beginning of that uprising by all the demonstrations going on in the streets of this country. I've written an arcane that I want to read to you. It's an arcane that's a suggestion and a hope. It's called, Arcane is the name for my little longer poems. It's called the CNN Arcane. It's in two parts. One, what you will not hear from the mouths of CNN, from that very sympathetic figure like Anderson Cooper, who delineates the lies of President Trump, or Don Lemon, who denounces outright those lies and grieves for the continually murdered the black men and women. But from whose mouth you will not hear, despite night after night and program after program, you will not hear the truth that underlies the killings of black, browns, and poor whites as well. That truth which is forbidden them to utter. Yes, all of them, from Wolf Blitzer to Dana Bash and uh, Brooke Baldwin, Chris Cuomo, all these recognizably sympathetic and would be considered progressive journalists and commentators are to a man and to a woman prohibited from telling the truth at the heart of the murders, the injustices, the inequities that all blacks and browns feel every day in this country. And that truth is that the evil and vicious, decadent and religiously money-making dimension of injustice is the system of capitalism itself. And that's why I've begun to call for the formation of the PCP not the PCP as in the angel dust drug, nor the primal care physician, but the People's Communist Party. For it's time we the people comes fully to the front of all decent humane motion after weeks, even months of protesting in the streets and becomes the necessary reality too. Make no mistake, the thousands upon thousands of people who marched in Washington on the anniversary of the I Have a Dream speech of Martin Luther King Jr. 57 years ago belong to the PCP. And if they say, no, I'm not a communist, Tell them American communism isn't like the past forms of that ideology. That ours is born in the recognition that this land was created by slaves whose rights as human beings have never been fully achieved, who to this very day walk in fear of being murdered by the police who are there to protect the interests of the capitalists, which is the private property at the root of capitalism itself. 
we are seeing the mistake being corrected and it is genuine to admit a mistake corrected in the peaceful protest all over the country. It is the people, the new young generation who've had enough of the lies of the thugs and the monsters of capitalism and the police that protect their interests. It's over for them. The people of the future of the PCP will see to it that every child will go to university without having to pay a cent. That every person will have health care for as long as he and she lives without paying a cent. That every family shall pay a rent that is humanly affordable. That landlords shall become community leaders rather than abominable greeters that the roots of black murders, the Ku Klux Klan and neo-Nazis shall be put where they belong and have belonged for generations in jails. And the PCP will finish with the lie of capitalism, which is a curse and cause of all the grief of wars in the world. We know the current president is a lying criminal and an insult to children. He embodies the essence of capitalist piggery and is the apprentice of nothingness, a billionaire's fart in the face of anyone decent. He's revealed the absolute necessity for a complete overturning of the whole capitalist system. Because while Biden must be voted for to rid the land and the world of that lying puke Trump, the Democrats themselves have for the past two generations also embraced the corporate world. And we should remember what Mussolini said that fascism isn't the correct word for what his movement was about. The correct word is corporatism, which migrated from Italy to Peronist Argentina to Nixonian America after World War II. We've been living under friendly, quote, fascism, end quote for the past 75 corporate years, but neither the Democrats nor the Republicans will change their fundamental adherence to the capitalism of which they are together, the capitalist party of the USA until now, and we, and the PCP. And now I would just like to close by reading just one short poem, especially for all the poets and prose writers too. Pass, go to your broken heart. If you think you don't have one, get one. To get one, be sincere. Learn sincerity of intent by letting life enter because you're helpless really to do otherwise. Even if you try escaping, let it take you and tear you open like a letter sent, like a sentence inside you've waited for all your life, though you've committed nothing. Let it send you up. Let it break you, heart. Broken heartedness is the beginning of all real reception. The year of humility, humility goes beyond the gate. See the gates opening. 
Feel your hands going akimbo on your hips, your mouth opening like a womb, giving birth to your voice for the first time. Go singing, whirling into the glory of being ecstatically simple. Write the poem. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Wow. So thank you. Thank you to everyone. And um, thanks to the San Francisco Public Library. And thanks for Zooming with us. See you next year. I've unmuted everyone so you can really clap. Yay. Good. Hey, thank you, Joyce. Thank you, Joyce. Thank you, everyone. That was thank wonderful. Great. Thank you. Can I say that I thought there were great books, dozens of great books this time. Oh, there really were. They were spectacular. Thank you. Was... Nice work, everyone. Joyce, you pulled it off in short notice and great work all. Ooh. Wine o'clock. <laughs> yes. I wish that we could all join each other for drinks, but maybe. Um, I was thinking one thing that would be nice is if we all got um, invitations to if there is an in-person gala next year, um, so that we can all be sure to at least you know convene in person maybe and um, celebrate next year's awardees. Yes. That yes. would be lovely. That'd be great. Yes, we usually wonderfully have it in at Corrette Auditorium at the main branch to the of the library and um, we have a reception afterwards and uh, do exactly that so um, hopefully fingers crossed we'll be able to do it. God willing and the crick don't rise. Exactly. <laughs> Carvel lost his internet connection but he sends his love and says uh, goodbye to everybody. Mm. Yeah. And maybe we can get together at some private little saloon and have drinks. After. But there aren't saloons, um, Jim. Not this time, next time. <laughs> next time, next time. I'm with Jim. Saloons. <laughs> salon. Long may they wave. Uh, uh, there's uh, been a request for you to pronounce uh, the name of the Golden State Warrior athlete that we uh, <laughs> <laughs> Iguodala. Iguodala. Yeah. Yes. Iguodala. I, I'm sure I got it wrong, but I did my best. Yes. Iguodala. Best shoulders. Phonetic. <laughs> Northern California has such a great diversity of names. Uh, that's one of the blessings of living in this area. So it's it's an awesome place to And live. I'll just chime in that my name is pronounced Island. Just I'm sorry. I tried. I got it right the second time, I think. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> thank you so much. Or closer. Let's say closer, Josie. Closer. Funny. <laughs> oh God. It's I enjoyed it greatly. Thank had, you. had you been here in person, I would have asked you before, but it was. I'd like to say Tamim answer is great too. Yeah. Oh, of course. Wonderful. Um, and I and I'm so glad that Burden Beckett is part of this whole. He's my they're my neighborhood bookstore and such a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful place. So um thank you to those guys. Yeah. We've been really trying to support the bookstores during closure and partner like that. I just really want to thank all of you for joining us. This is all, we just, our, our true intent is to honor all of these nominated books. And that's why every press release we send out, every, everything we send out has the names of every nominee, not just winners. We, the whole list is what we are interested in sharing with people. And so it'll be on the poetryflash.org website and We'll send out press releases with all of the, again, we've already done it, but we will do it again with all of the nominees on it. And 